so another one we could talk about is homocysteine. So homocysteine is an amino acid, and it's actually produced when proteins are broken down. So we've got vitamins, B vitamins like B12, B6, and folate help to metabolize homocysteine. And if it's not properly metabolized, so some people have an, a gene mutations that can affect their uh, methylation, so they don't metabolize homocysteine as well, then that homocysteine builds up in the body. So, and it acts like a toxin. So it can create, um, you know, it can damage your cardiovascular system, your neurological system, your endocrine system. So it's a very inflammatory when it rises. So that that's another marker we really like to look at. And we want to see that less than seven. We know if it's over 10, you're really, you know, elevated. And a lot of times that's an indication that B12 is deficient. So we want to look at the B12 level two. Like I said before, B12 deficiencies can mimic some of the cognitive decline symptoms. So that's a marker we like to look at. Yeah, absolutely. And homocysteine, when it's properly metabolized, turns on in, or basically it turns into glutathione, which is your body's master antioxidant, and also SAMe, which is a major precursor to all your major neurotransmitters. And so when homocysteine is elevated, it can also be related to lower levels of glutathione because your body's not able to actually create it from the homocysteine, as well as lower levels of SAMe, which can affect mood, brain, detoxification, a lot of different things like that. And homocysteine itself is just a a, a toxic, it's a necessary uh, protein, but it's also is toxic at high levels. And so we want to keep that under control. And that's a really key one to look at higher levels are associated with neurodegeneration, strokes, heart attacks, right? So, um, you know, very important one to keep your finger on is looking at homocysteine levels. And we see people all the time with very high levels, 12, 13, 14, mm -hmm. they're just walking around like they have no idea. That is a significant risk factor for some sort of a, you know, major health condition later on in life. Right. Yeah. Um, and I don't always see that on labs when people are bringing in their labs, often mm. homocysteine is not included. So that's yep. one you definitely want to request from your doctor. Another one that's not often included that I really think is underestimated or under underrated would be LDH. So that's lactate yeah. dehydrogenase. And um, I heard a recent interview with you and Dr. Nasha Winters where she was talking about that's one of her key markers that she looks at. And when that's elevated, we know our mitochondria are off. So our mitochondria are in our cells. Or they're basically like the energy in your cells. So if, if those are off, then that can affect met metabolism. But elevated levels of LDH um, can indicate inflammation. So we like to see that between 140 and 180. When it's over 180, then yeah, that could be inflammation. I often we'll see that low. So when that's under 140, mm -hmm. then that's that's a sign that the the individual is actually having some reactive hypoglycemia. So blood sugar could be, could be dropping too low, which also can be a, when blood sugar is too low, that can cause neurological issues. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's a key enzyme and part of the glycolytic cycle of metabolizing pyruvate and lactic acid and kind of converting them and it's all part of the process of actually, you know, basically creating cellular energy. And so, um, you know, it needs to be in the right amount and, uh, yeah, high levels can, can definitely be related to inflammation, but low levels, like you said, can be a, a major problem because if somebody is having hypoglycemic episodes and their body's not very good at converting, you know, basically stored sugar into, uh, energy or, or stored fat into energy, then they're, you know, from a brain perspective, their neurons are not getting the fuel that they need. All neurons need a continual supply of oxygen, fuel, and activation, right? And the fuel would be in the form of glucose or ketones. Those are the two energy sources that neurons or brain cells are going to run on. And so, and glucose being, you know, primary source. And so if we're not getting that, then uh, you know those neurons are going to start to die, and then they actually release a lot of chemicals when they die, and we get this excitotoxicity where um, basically it just creates kind of this cascade, almost like a domino effect, damaging all the neurons around it. So, and this is why, you know, when you have hypoglycemia, you feel you know you're, you're you you have a lot of neurological symptoms, hangriness, mm -hmm. irritability, um, 
you know, nausea can actually is actually more of a, you know, when it comes to hypoglycemia, it's actually more of a neurological issue where part of the brain stem is being affected that controls your um your gag reflex and kind of a sensation of nausea can occur. And so um, you know, and this and, and cravings are also associated with that. So very, very important that you take good care of your blood sugar and obviously keeping inflammation under control and LDH is something that we like to look at with that. But you're right. Most doctors are never looking at that marker. So it's an important marker to look at. Yeah. So it used to be part of the metabolic panel um, and then it, mm-hmm. they took it off the metabolic panel. But speaking of blood sugar, that's definitely a great segue to the glucose, fasting insulin, and A1C. I wanted to talk about those because blood sugar imbalances are one of the key causes of inflammation. So elevated blood sugar is one of the biggest risk factors for general inflammation. It causes brain fog, depression, so so many issues. Just um, So blood fasting, so you want to get, get fasting, blood glucose, fasting insulin, and again, Fasting insulin, I rarely see. You have to request that. So even for my clients that have diabetes, I rarely see a fasting insulin. But um, so fasting blood glucose, we like to see it less than 90. So even better around 75 to 80. Um, If over 100, then we know there may be some insulin resistance or pre-diabetic or diabetic condition going. So I like to pair that with fasting insulin. So with insulin, um, you know, it's a great way to detect inflammation because of the connection between insulin resistance and inflammation. So optimal, we like less than five. Um, Higher than five can indicate insulin resistance. Um, And then A1C, so that's your average blood sugar. So that's going to look at a period of around 90 days and test what percentage of hemoglobin proteins in your blood are coated with sugar or glycated? So um, hemoglobin proteins um, are found in red blood cells and they transport oxygen. So the higher your A1C is, the poorer your blood sugar control and the higher your risk of complications. So this really contributes to oxidative stress and inflammation in the body. And with A1C, we like to see it between 4.7 and 5.2. Um, you know, conventional range is below 5.7. And then, you know, one interesting thing is like 5.7, you're fine. 5. Point, or 5.6, <laughs> you're, you're normal. 5.7, you're pre-diabetic. You know, it's such a, a, a slippery slope there. So that's why we like to, again, look at that functional range of less than 5.2. And, and then we know if it's over 6.5, that's an indication that you do have diabetes. So um, great yeah. markers to look at. Mm-hmm. 